one of, the, one of the things I wanted to talk about today in my introductions, in my introduction to this panel, uh, is about labor and invisible labor, and in particular about the kind of labor we do in the academy and what that has to do with everything we've been talking about for the last two days. Now, so I'd just like to point out to you that little invisible sprites don't come in and clean the room after you, but actual humans who used to be employed by the university, but now the university outsources its uh, cleaning up uh, uh, labor to people who don't speak English and who come in very late at night and when I'm in my office they're there talking on their cell phone in case they're going to get beat up by strangers and, but it's only me but so anyway if you know you could think about the labor that produces the reproduction of the hierarchy between the mind and the body as a, something that makes it possible for us to sit in a room for two days that would be good and then you know to clean up. Um, but I wanted to think about labor a little bit today and to think about university labor uh, and to say that uh, our two speakers, Michael Hart um, and, and uh, Kaushik Sundararajan, actually in their work are always meta-theorizing the relation between a general theory of capital, a general theory of value and the problem of the subjectification of labor and what we do in universities and what, and what we do as thinkers and that that you know, I've been listening a lot to, well actually I couldn't be here yesterday because I was busy reproducing the life of my department in a job search situation where I had to read 200 files and I, I couldn't come because we're acting as though we're in a condition of business as usual, but we're not in the condition of business as usual and yet as, as everyone's been saying, the, the institutional practices that look in disbelief at the economic crisis pretend for a long time to act as though business as usual is happening without changing any of their practices, like changing their pedagogy or changing their relation to knowledge or, or changing the way they talk to an audience or changing the docility of the audience in relation to them, which we're so grateful for. And yet we also, because it's good manners, and we have good manners too, but we actually, want to, we actually hope that there would be other kinds of manner and other kinds of situation for the circulation of knowledge than the one that we're reproducing here. And so, you know, we've been thinking a lot today about about contingency and crisis, and we've been thinking a lot about the hidden and explicit sociality of, of finance capital and of value creation in general, and also the, the fantasy life of living on the credit bubble and what it would mean for the credit bubble not to be there and yet to try to imagine reproducing life anyway. What, is, what does the good life mean now? And in relation to that, what kind of world are we actually educating people for? And what do we think about that? Now, in uh, Kushak's work and in Michael's work, too, they talk a lot about recalibrating the relation of life, love, and labor in response to the convergence of emergent contingencies of the historical present. Life, love, and labor. That those are kind of idioms that haven't been really operative so much in the conference that I've heard so far. Um, and then thinking about what it would mean to change knowledge in relation to those things. I think it's important, actually, to try to figure out what it would mean to take what you know and then try to figure out what world you're teaching for. And of course, what we normally do is we close our eyes and hope that we're like ethically good enough pedagogues or something. But that can't be right. So I think trying to think about that um, in, the next, uh, in the next panel and, and later would be a really great idea. Um, Michael has recently made the claim, made an argument about, in, on, on the, the website EduFactory, which if you don't know it, I think would be a good, good thing to read that um, uh, the biopolitical economy of mass intelligence, which is also something, and mass affectualization and mass sensoria, and the idea that capital is actually, uh, you know, has produced a, a saturation of your sensorium in order to create value so that you become a person who is selling yourself in the market and selling your senses in the market and selling your affective capacities in the market. Um, uh, that. Uh, if that's what drives economic innovation, then universities now have to adapt to producing subjects who can saturate them, their sensoria toward the production of these new kinds of knowledge. And of course, that used to be called unalienated labor, but now unalienated labor is alienated labor because of the, sort of the closeness of the relations of production to your sensorium. So we're in a bind. So what would unalienated labor look like now? Do we even know? And what, is it, what relation does that have to the good life? Uh, that people are imagining, do, do we know that? And, um, and how do we think about what, other than making a citizenship claim for what kinds of students we produce, what are we claiming about what the university can be in its democratization of the right to experiment and the right for research? So these are the kinds of things that our two speakers have, have written about in their, in their different but you know, really related ways um, uh, over the last decade at least. 
Uh, Kaushik Sundararajan has um, is will go second in, on this panel, and he has just become our colleague, which is totally thrilling. And his big book is Biocapital: The Constitution of Post-Genomic Life, it's a, um, 2006 book, and he has a forthcoming book called Lively Capital: Biotechnologies, Ethics, and Governance in Global Markets. And Michael Hart is, you know, the co-author with with Negri of uh, the trilogy Empire, Multitude, and Commonwealth. He's also a great theorist of the political theory of love and many other things. And he's a great translator, too, of Agamben, The Coming Community, and Language and Death, A Place of Negativity, and, and many other things. So um, each of the speakers is going to talk for 25 minutes. And then we have um, a, uh, a comment um, by Andreas Glazer, as we've had. And then we'll actually have time for discussion. Thanks very much. Um, thanks, Lauren, and, and um, I want to apologize first to the discussant for not having real paper. Maybe I should at the same time apologize to you all for not having a real argument. Um, and also apologize for uh, beginning or creating a frame around uh, ancient Greek thought, which I do not just out of intellectual dilettantism, of which I'm usually guilty. Um, but also because sometimes this, this kind of exercise uh, forces me to think something new. I have a f great fear of, of repeating myself. Um, so here goes the, the opening frame, and I'll, and I'll make sense out of it, I, I hope. Oh, yeah, the title is Falsify the Currency, exclamation point. Um, so in the, fourth century, in the fourth century before the Christian era, there were the two most famous men in the Greek world were Alexander of Macedonia and Diogenes of Sinope. Alexander ruled the world. Diogenes lived like a dog. Diogenes would later become the central legendary figure of the ancient cynics. According to one ancient historian, Diogenes went to the oracle at Delphi to ask advice and was given this mandate, falsify the currency. <laughs> Even stranger if you think in, in the context of the, what the oracle says about and to, to Socrates. I mean that you know, Socrates is the greatest because he knows himself the best, so that know thyself is in a way the mandate for, for Socrates. For Diogenes, it's falsify the currency. Uh, so, and also, yeah, para que, que time, it's like, uh, um, it's change the character of the coin, you know, change the face of the coin. So scholars explain, you know, scholars try to explain away what's going on here is that Diogenes or his father worked in a mint or was a banker or was a money changer and was then convicted of counterfeiting and then exiled to, to Athens. But that doesn't really change the mystery of, at least for me, of this mandate, which I find interesting. Why would the oracle instruct Diogenes to change the face of the currency? Uh, and what could this link to the militancy for social change of the ancient cynics how could this be employed within that militancy? Which I'll mention, I guess, at the end. Uh, and that's what interests me about the ancient cynics in general. So I'll come back to that, but that's sort of my, my question. What could we make, or how could we make our own the mandate to falsify the currency, to change the face of the currency? Now, you could easily imagine, especially in our discussions about the crisis, that the falsification of the currency, that we have examples of that, plenty of examples of that, as the cause of the crisis itself. I mean, many times you could give, one way to give examples is about the actions of the IMF in Argentina and Southeast Asia is what's, what they've really been doing is falsifying the currency. Um, and that, or another one you could give, and, and this is one that Leo Panish explained a certain amount, and in a way sets up my argument, which I think would be good, is I want to contest this notion, I think a rather standard one, the standard narrative that the crisis results from the subordination of the real economy to the fictional economy. Like I said, Leo, Leo man, mentioned this at least in passing a year earlier. So the, the notion goes something like that the bankers or speculators uh, falsify the currency or really falsify real values. And at stake here is the materiality and the measurability of real, often industrial values. So the problem from this perspective is that the fictional economy, finance in general, has eclipsed and hijacked the real economy and real values. It has effaced or counterfeited the currency. The crisis is thus also a, a crisis of measure. The real and measurable values of material goods 
have been defaced in the financial instruments and their measures distorted. And so the solution from this perspective is to restore the primacy of the real economy and, uh, and subordinate to it finance and fictional values, that this will restore the real face of value. Now, in a way, the way Leo presented too, I think that, and I think it's true that maybe we would all, there's a certain caricature of this that we would all agree is not the case. And yet I think there's a, quite a residual value of this uh, notion of the real versus the fictional economy and that the crisis or, or the problem of finance capital in general being precisely that, this, this is junction between the real and fictional. I want to try to argue instead that there's a symmetrical relationship between finance and the currently dominant or emerging dominant form of capitalist production, which I sometimes end up calling immaterial production, sometimes biopolitical production. And so this is the uh, argument I want to make for a few minutes before I can, can go on. And this notion of symmetry is what I want to arrive at, the thing that I'm trying to think through in a way. So, um, this, uh, so I'm talking about now you know, the emergency of the dominance of biopolitical production. This more or less cuts diagonally across the Braudelian cycles that uh, many were describing yesterday morning. I mean, the point of inflection is, is more or less the same period, 1968 to 1973. It corresponds in some ways to the, to the C to M phase that, um, that, that Beverly was posing. It's, um, it, it, it's quite different, though, in a way to the, you know, I love that autumnal character in the Braudelian discourses. I mean, it has such pathos that goes with it. But this is different, uh, I think, than that, or, or at least poses differently the, the shift. Um, in a way it relates actually more to Beverly's other work that she didn't talk about yesterday about both uh, the powers of labor and powers of labor revolt. Okay, so here's the claim, you know, uh, or hypothesis. I think the first parts of it are relatively uh, widely accepted. They go something like this. Well, actually there's a basis before the claims, which is this, that in each period of capitalist production, one form or sector holds a dominant position, holds a dominant position over the other sectors of the economy and over society as a whole. So the first part of this, which I think is relatively widely accepted, that the, for the last 150 years, industry has um, been dominant within the capitalist economy and over society as a whole. Now, what I mean by that is not that industry has been dominant, you know, say since Marx's time, you know, 1850 or so. It's not a quantitative argument, this. You know, so when Marx is writing in 1850, 1860, and he's talking about the tendency of the dominance of, cap, uh, of industry within the capitalist economy, it's not, he's not saying that most workers are in the factory. Like, even in, in England, the most advanced capitalist society, most of the workers were still in the field. It's not a quantitative argument. And for the last 150 years hasn't been, there's really been no phase, not in any of the societies, I would think, but I'm no specialist in that sort of thing, that uh, most of the workers have been in the factory. Rather, it's been that the qualities of the factory have been imposed over other sectors of the economy and over society as a whole. The industry has been, so that, so that it's uh, mechanization, it's uh, disciplinary routines, it's, uh, even its temporalities have been if uh, had been affected the other sectors and, and society as a whole, so that agriculture had to industrialize in the sense that mining had to industrialize, the society as a whole had to industrialize. And like I say, even as temporalities is one of the most interesting parts. So here are a, a, a useful, easy reference for me, since most people know it too, is the, the famous E.P. Thompson article about the advent of clocks in England, what is it called, labor time discipline, something like that, um, in, which, in which he's talking about the shift in temporality that was, that was created precisely by this predominance of, of, uh, of industrial production within the capitalist economy, that before this, people measured time in the, in the time it took certain tasks, the time it took to milk the cows, the time of, of various tasks, and rather, since then, not only in the factory, but in the rest of the economy and in, throughout society, the uh, discipline-bound, uh, homogeneous, uh, clock-bound quantitative time has always. So that sense of temporality and time is, uh, um, is pervasive. And that, that's indicative, I would say, of this hegemony of one part, with, of one sector of the economy within, within the whole and society as a whole. So then the second point, so that first point seems to me really 
whatever, relatively easy. Second, also seems relatively easy, I would say, is that industrial production today no longer holds that position. Now the third part, the, the one that, that um, is more contestable, there you go, uh, that uh, Tony Negri and I and a series of other people argue, is that uh, a, a new form or sector of production is, is, is emerging in that central role that we sometimes call immaterial production rather awkwardly, sometimes called biopolitical production, maybe equally awkwardly. And what we mean by it is a series of, of, of uh, productive activities oriented towards why we call it immaterial, like oriented towards partially or largely immaterial goods, like the production of ideas, production of code, uh, the production of images, um, pharmaceuticals would certainly fit in, uh, under this, uh, also the production of affects, which is certainly important to me in this. Um, and so, yeah, so why do we call it, well, okay, I'll come back to it. So again, it's not a question about quantities. It's not saying, uh, for certainly not that there are fewer people in the factory today. There, if you think of it globally, there are more people in the factory today than there were 10 years ago, 50 years ago, et cetera. But rather that the factory operates or within a diff, in a different position within the global hierarchies of labor and power. So that the factory in Detroit in 1930 is very different than the Ford plant in the ABCs surrounding Sao Paulo or the Honda plant in China, that, that in fact they're in a different position with regard to the dominance of the economy. And also that they exist uh, within the hegemony of, another, of another, another productive form. So that today the factory has to, or industry has to, informationalize. Like, so just as the way agriculture had to industrialize previously, today industry has to informationalize, become communicative, uh, also become image-oriented, even to adopt affects. So that would be the, the thing. Now, this, would, this is something, one thing that I'm not saying, or it should be, well, I should make clear about this, is it's not simply a matter of uh, changes within the dominant countries in the world or the dominant parts of the world. Or rather, such a claim wouldn't make any sense, I think, if that were only the case. So there are two ways of, of approaching this. One is that um, to point to ways in which this same shift is happening in industries and sectors of production elsewhere. Like, for instance, I've been very interested for a while in these so-called seed wars, where in agriculture, you know, the ownership of seeds, which is really about information or germplasm of seeds is really what it's about. So it's a similar way in which agriculture has to, in which information and knowledge becomes primary in agriculture itself. Similarly, with notions of biopiracy, which are popular in Brazil and India, so by, by biopiracy it means the, the privatization of often indigenous knowledges about, for instance, the pesticidal character of a seed or the medicinal character of a plant, that these tradi uh, traditional and uh, knowledges produced within indigenous communities are then, by, say, Monsanto, privatized uh, and, and, and made private property Hence the piracy um, thing. So there too, it's a matter of, let's say, information, code, ideas. You know, here this is say indigenous knowledges in this case that are uh, becoming the dominant qualities in a variety of sectors of production. See what I mean? That's what I'm getting at. Yeah, biopiracy. I hate that term because it's it's an insult to pirates everywhere. Um, <laughs> Uh, because pirates generally steal property. What's being stolen here is the common. You know, it's something common that's been produced in the community and, and transformed into property. property. Yeah, this is really actually all there, an argument about the common, um, saying that these, that's what is being produced in, these, uh, in this type of production that I'm talking about are in some ways fundamentally common goods, ideas, uh, code, information, affects, etc. And similarly, this is the where another a part of the discussion would go if I was going that way. The way that this notion of the common as an ecological concept would also function in the same way. That in fact the biopiracy would be a good hinge for doing that discussion, if I were going to go down that road. Um, yeah, clearly this blurs the boundary between production and reproduction. That would be another discussion. Uh, another thing that seems useful in here, I mean, in some ways the concepts itself that Tony and I have been working with are derived from a certain tradition within um, socialist feminist theory within the U.S. And, and the U.K., these notions of affective labor that we're working with are really from these discourse about care, caring labor, kin work, even maternal labor, 
um, that was prominent in the 1980s. And then Arlie Hochschild's work also about uh, emotional labor, flight attendants, uh, legal assistance, and, it's, um, and the gender character of it, of course, is, is crucial in this. Okay, so the reason I might call it biopolitical labor is that what's really being produced here finally are forms of life. I mean, material commodities are often being produced, material acts are also being uh, done, you know, say in health care, in education. I mean, in, in health care, of course, material acts are being done. You change bedpans, you stitch wounds, but you're also producing a sense of well-being, a sense of ease. A lot of the job is really an, an affective production. I mean, similarly with flight attendants, that would be the thing. What do flight attendants do? They do safety procedures, they pass out. No, they don't even pass out pillows anymore. I, I don't know what they do. But most of what they do are you know, being nice to people who are jerks. That's sort of what, what the job description is. And that's, and it, so what I mean is it's, a lot of it is a affective, an affective production. So what I'm, I guess what I'm saying here, and part of the way it blurs the boundary between production and reproduction is um, that in some ways the material commodity that is, that is produced in this kind of production, you know, even the automobile or the refrigerator, appears only as a mid-step toward what the real end result here is the production of social, uh, a production of social relations or production of forms of life. Yeah, like when Marx says that the, the capital is fundamentally a social relation. I mean, that's partly, I think, ever more presently revealed in this, in this, um, in this context. It would, of course, another avenue I could go down here is to force us to rethink the notion of development in this context. Like, what does development mean when we're thinking in terms of, of, of this emergingly dominant form of production. There you go, it'd be, it'd be somewhat different. Another thing that I find very interesting, there would be sort of a research agenda for me, but hasn't really been yet, that David Harvey mentioned yesterday, is that along with this, this process, there's really a shift from profit to rent as the primary mode of capitalist expropriation. I mean, so when, when Marx is talking about profit, for instance, and about I was thinking about that chapter in Cooperation, Volume One, where the capitalist is really fundamental in the in the in the production process itself. The the capitalist creates and provides the the, the mechanisms of cooperation, the means of discipline, etc. The capitalist is in, in some ways internal to the production process. In these in these kinds of processes I'm talking about here, the production of affect, the production of images, ideas, etc. The capitalist is really external to the production process, and that rent is really the mode. Uh, of this uh, of expropriation that 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 signals that that external stance, something like that. So that the same way that in the early 20th century there was talk, and this is what David referenced yesterday, and like in Keynes's joke about the euthanasia of the rentier, um, there was a passage from interest-bearing rent, you know, interest-bearing capital to profit. Uh, there is, I would say, today a shift from profit to rent. I hope that made a little bit of sense. That what's at stake at part here, here's a way of, of, I think, grasping onto one thing that interests me of this, is the question of measure. I mean, the values of material and tangible products uh, corresponded to uh, regimes of economic measure. But the values of immaterial or intangible products are not measurable, at least by traditional measures. Uh, the, the, the production of forms of life, or even the production of the common, if I was thinking about it that way, um, is in some ways resistant to measure. And I would say, but this is something that Edward uh, Lupuman knows much more about than I, that, that finance in general, and derivatives in particular, serve to stamp measure on, or translate into economic values, some productive processes that are fundamentally immeasurable. And so that, uh, so you could think about now this defacing the currency or the paracaraxis, uh, the, the um, changing the character, changing the face of value is what, uh, is what finance does to these. Now this of course isn't, so if you, if you look at it this way and we look at the shift that I'm lining up in a way with the uh, S curves that, that Beverly was talking about yesterday, you might think of this as a C to M phase. I mean, in certain ways, I suppose it does correspond to that. It's it's rather though it's rather than the shift from the commodity to money. It's a shift from uh, the materiality of the commodities to its to a immaterial but nonetheless commodified and um, forms. I, I, and so, if it's not autumnal, I wouldn't say it's 
primaveral, what do you say the opposite? Spring-like. Um, it's, it's, it's in a way, uh, uh, right, I guess I don't have any season for it. I wish I did. Okay. Um, so anyway, so here we get the arrival of it. The, the, the relationship between economic production to finance is not the relation of the real to the fictional. In fact, if, if, if one were to accept that hypothesis that I've just laid out, yeah, by which you could say, like, Mike, how can you prove any of that that you said? Like, how do you prove that's true, what you just said? I mean, one thing I could do is to point towards, you know, uh, what, is, what is dominant and subordinate in the global economy. Like, that, that, that if the kind of practices I'm talking about are, are in some ways dominant and what's subordinate. Which, what the real, I mean, what that doesn't, or what are the growth industries and the dominant co corporations? I mean, that in some ways education, healthcare are among the largest growth sectors in some of the dominant countries. That seems like a nice evidence. But I think the real, the real proof, if, if there's going to be proof in this, is that the qualities that I, of the kinds of production I've been talking about are, will be progressively imposed over other sectors of the economy and over society as a whole. Like one way I would go into this that would relate to that uh, Thompson article I was talking about before is today we have a new temporality, even at work, like a destruction of the working day. And that that is now becoming generalized. The destroyed working day, the lack of distinction between work and non-work, which was typical, I would say, of the, of the industrial era. Um, what do I mean by this? Like at the high end of the economy, I mean that like at the Microsoft campus or the Oracle campus, apparently at Bear Stearns, I didn't know anything about that, there's progressively little distinction between work and non-work. You know, like at the Microsoft campus, they do anything to keep you there working. You know, there's a gym, you get massage, you can eat, anything as long as you don't go home. You know, which is a kind of, what I remember, it seemed like being a student, but the kind of horror in it. Um, but also at the low end of the economy, obviously, what, what we mean, in fact, by precarious work is precisely a lack of distinction between work time and non-work time, the where you wait tables in the afternoon, your security guard in the evening, you do some other task at night, I don't know exactly what. So that there again, the destruction of the working day, a new temporality that, that destroys the difference between work and non-work. Okay, so, um, and what I meant now about, so if you were to accept my hypothesis, then you could see, I think, the, a kind of symmetrical relationship between finance and this biopolitical production I'm talking about. Uh, I wouldn't say that the, it's not a really question of real and fictional anymore. It's a question about measure and immeasurability. That I think that's, it's, it's at that plane that there's a symmetrical relationship um, and something I'd like to work out. Yeah, uh, Christian Marazzi, the Italian Swiss economist who writes mostly about this notion of a symmetry, and, I, and I'm trying to figure it out. Okay, so here's one way of going with that. So it's not a struggle of real versus fictional, but rather a struggle over the power to produce and reproduce forms of life, that is, to produce the face or character of the currency. Uh, yeah, what we call it, valorization of values. That's Nietzsche's way of saying it. So the problem with finance is not its unreality or even its abstraction, but the way it imposes control over forms of life. So what would it mean for us to make our own the mandate, Diogenes' mandate, to face or falsify the currency? Um, like I said, what, how would we make that as our mandate? Maybe the revalorization of values as our mandate. In some ways it would be to recuperate the power of money. I mean, thinking of money now as um, the abstract representation and control of values. How could we recuperate that as our own? So just as finance is symmetrical to biopolitical production, so too symmetrical to the defacing of the currency by finance capital, we must develop a project to give new value to wealth, to create and instantiate new forms of life. Okay, this is the point that I'm supposed to have an answer. Um, and I don't really have an answer. What I have, in fact, usually, I was thinking about this earlier in some of the papers, my usual reaction to the question when people ask what is to be done, especially in a context like this, is to try to shift the question to what are people already doing. It's not really a matter of modesty. It's a matter of what, uh, what our position is and, and can be. Um, so I had two ideas about this. And one of them, I'll, I don't have to say much more about that. I was going to talk about the student movements, California, uh, in the UC system, in, in or the Cal State system too, and, and then the current ones in Italy and the UK. Really what I wanted to do is just indicate there the way in which the university and even the humanities in some sense um, 
is coordinated with the kind of production I'm claiming is emergently dominant within the capitalist regime. Do you see what I mean? That in some ways, what is uh, most necessary for capitalist development is precisely the mass intelligence that, uh, that the broad university uh, project is aimed at, even the humanities project of it. I mean, in some ways, what I wanted to do was to, to, to reinforce a general truth, I mean, an old slogan in a, in a tradition which I feel a part, that struggles precede and prefigure the development of capital. And it's something that Mario Tronzi said in a book that, that is, whatever, it, it called Workers and Capital that was important for a certain tradition in the early 60s. Okay, that would be the thing about students. The other way of uh, confronting it would be look at the movements against austerity to Dre and try to read from them certain aspects. Uh, one way I, one could do this is to look from Buenos Aires in 2001 to Athens in 2010 and recognize their commonalities and the and not only their commonalities but their, their limitations, let's say that. I mean, so here's three common elements it seems to me. Uh, that, that um, between the struggles in Argentina and those in Greece, 10 years apart, both in reaction to the crisis. In some ways I would say also that France, Ireland, Portugal, at least the recent developments in those countries fit within this. Anyway, okay, so here's three common elements. One is the, the Argentinian slogan, que se vayan todos, you know, that throw them all out, I think would be the English expression, that it was uh, against the entire political class. The struggles. I mean, in 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 in, in Greece last last spring, the the, the May fifth uh, general strike de demonstration in May fifth, you know, of two thousand ten, the one in which the, the the tragic burning of the in which there was the tragic burning of the bank with where three people died. The, what was interesting about that day was the transformation of the mass, you know, not. Uh, politically mobilized, but incredibly mass population to like the, the notion that what they had to do that day was to burn down the parliament. Like that's what the decision had been before the bank was burned. We, what we need to do is go to burn down the parliament, which seems to me coordinated with that Argentinian que se vayan todos, like that we throw them all out. Okay, number two thing that was, was really that these were movements really of poverty, or are, I mean the creation of a new poor, the destruction of the middle classes in these countries. And the third most interesting is about the formation of um, arrangements of self-organization, you know, like that is, they're not only protest movements, but movements to try to construct a possible political alternative, which was much stronger in Argentina, I would say, in 2001 than it's been in, in Greece um, in this last year. Um, I mean, in, in the, both the organization of the unemployed, the, these um, in, in Argentina that, that participated in these piquetes, the piqueteros, uh, the assembly movements in, in Argentina, the construction of local and uh, uh, urban and non-urban uh, assemblies for direct democracy within the capital and other forms of self-organization, you know, taking over the factories too. Um, all of these seem to me like elements of trying to construct an alternative. And what's interesting to me is that the, the, the discussion in Argentina since then, uh, among the movements, or at least the segments of them that I know, uh, it has been about the failure, the failure of those movements in that austerity crisis to create lasting institutions, the failure to create a social alternative. In fact, the failure to create lasting forms of life um, in the in this in the in the struggles of that of that moment. So this is why I'm attracted to the cynics um, that they. Um, is the kind of militancy, um, Foucault called it a biopolitical militancy, that the cynics had. Uh, that they were not only like dogs, I mean, that, that, so, they, were, like, they were dog philosophers, yeah, they were poor, they operated through scandals to existing social norms, they barked and bit social institutions, that was the way, but they also constructed uh, institutions of, of a new form of life. And that's, I guess, if it would be uh, the criterion, I guess I would, I would hold up that at least would be a guide. I don't think any of these current social movements are movements capable of challenging the system as a whole, but uh, seem to me sometimes in, in negative form to provide that as a mandate. 
which I think I'm trying to correspond to this falsify the currency, uh, to construct a form of biopolitical militancy that's capable of the creation and institution of uh, lasting new forms of life. That's all I have. Thanks. So that's on. Okay, great. So thanks, thanks very much to um, to Mosh for inviting me. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here, and thank you, Lauren, for your generous introduction, and Michael for that wonderful paper, um, which I hope my paper will build upon and be in conversation with. Um, I have to apologize. I usually don't do PowerPoint, and for some reason, I'm doing it today. And, um, and I'm doing it because I want to try and get through quite a bit, and I thought some bullet points uh, on top might be useful. Um, as a consolation, and you probably can't see it, there's a blurred photo of a disintegrated textile mill in the background. Um, the, what, what I do want to have is, um, is, is have two kind of uh, implicit um, arguments that are in the background that are animating uh, the paper. One is that this is a sectorial analysis of the pharmaceutical industry, but, but I and others who have written about what we call biocapital um, are always trying to grapple with the relationship between the absolute specificity of particular sectors that have to be analyzed in their own terms and more general principles and dynamics of capital. So um, I'm not going to elaborate on that, but I'm neither saying that this is just a case study of capital nor am I saying that this is some kind of epochal shift in capitalism and now all capital is biocapital. So that's one, one kind of principle. Um, and, uh, and there again, you have a disintegrated textile mill in the background over which my biocapital bullet points will be imposed. Um, the, the second implicit argument is I often, um, like, like many of us in this room, like to go back to Marx to, to learn things and relearn things. And, and there's a certain thing that he um, said in the Grundrisse that's, that's also animating this in the background. So, so I'll just put that up and, and then I'll start with my paper. Um, <clears throat> So my paper looks at the political economy of drug development with a specific ethnographic focus on India and the United States. I wish to elucidate how the terrain of drug development has come to be configured in such a way that multiple actors manage simultaneously to be in crisis. I argue that this is the consequence of three structural historical shifts. The first is the appropriation of health by capital. The second is the increased salience over time of speculative capital, determining the ways in which capital-intensive drug development gets evaluated. And the third is the recent globalization of these appropriative speculative logics. I elaborate upon what I mean by these three shifts in the course of the paper. What I'm trying to trace is a political economy in which health comes to be the locus of surplus value generation. This leads to changes in the imagination of health itself. It also leads to certain imperatives to expand the surplus generating logic globally and has implications both for pharmaceutical industries and for patients in different parts of the world. There are three sets of actors that I focus on. The first is the multinational pharmaceutical industry, largely Euro-American, which is involved in research and development or R&D based drug development. The second are patients, both in developed country contexts such as the US and in developing country contexts such as India. And the third is the Indian pharmaceutical industry, which is primarily a generic industry with expertise in reverse engineering drugs and selling them at a lower cost than patented medication. Each of these actors are in crisis, but crisis itself is polymorphic. It doesn't mean the same thing for each of these actors. The terrain upon which the R&D-driven pharmaceutical industry operates is one marked by high drug prices. These are justified by the enormous cost and risk of the drug development process and they are made enforceable by patents which provide limited monopolies on drugs to their manufacturers. The factors that combine to configure the fundamentals of the market terrain that we now recognize in pharmaceutical development are the following. First, the development and growth of the pharmaceutical industry, which begins to focus on R&D-driven business models in the 1980s, leading to the development of blockbuster drugs that could earn over a billion dollars in annual revenue. Second, the elaboration of a regulatory infrastructure in which larger and more complex clinical trials become essential before drugs can be approved to market. 
And third, the emergent possibilities of biopharmaceutical development, that is the development of complex biological molecules as opposed to small organic chemical molecules as drugs. Enabled by the growth of the entrepreneurial university, the interest taken in biotech by both private and public speculative markets, and intellectual property regimes that facilitate patenting. A longer version of this paper explains the trajectories by which each of these factors materialized. Suffice to say here that all of these were in place as constitutive elements of the drug development process by the end of the 1980s. In the 1990s, a couple of further significant developments occurred. A Tufts University study showed that the price of developing a new drug was of the order of $250 million. These figures have been periodically updated, and the current Tufts estimate puts the cost of drug development at approximately a billion dollars a molecule. The calculus of drug development costs becomes a central part of the discussion, both in business and policy circles, on the relationship of drug R&D to drug pricing. What this led to was an elaboration of risk epistemology in drug development, especially considering that, as estimated, only one in five drug candidates tended to make it through clinical trials to market. The pricing of drugs then was not simply about recuperating investment costs, it was also about offsetting risk. Already, one sees a discursive shift in the descriptive tenor of drug development. In the speculative marketplace of the 1980s, drug development was sold as an investment opportunity full of promise. But by the 1990s, one also sees an elaborate rationality that highlights the drug development process as being full of potential pitfalls and minefields, extremely expensive and rife with the possibility of failure. One sees in this the prefiguration of a structure of crisis within the very discourse and grammar that celebrates the promise and potential of drug development. The second feature of the 1990s was the pioneering of off-label use as a business model. This involved selling a drug for an indication other than that for which it was initially approved. If cholesterol-lowering statins were emblematic of the 1980s model of R&D-driven blockbuster drug development, then Viagra, which was initially not approved for er erectile dysfunction, is the prime example of the 1990s model of revenue generation and market growth through off-label use. Along with these changes in the business models of pharmaceutical companies, one has also seen over the past 30 years the progressive movement of clinical trials into the private sector. In the mid to late 1990s, trials started moving out of the US to the rest of the world at a rapid rate. Adriana Petrina cites figures that show it that in 1995, 4,000 international non-US human subjects were recruited into clinical trials. This number had grown to 400,000 just four years later in 1999. By the turn of the century then, the contours of the pharmaceutical industry were as follows. This was a large industry that was extremely profitable, but these were profits that were built on the strength of a handful of blockbuster drugs, molecules that made in excess of a billion dollars a year. These offset the high rate of failure of drug candidates to make it through clinical trials, probably four drugs out of every five. Hence, this was an industry whose profits, although huge, depended upon a large amount of money from a small number of compounds. The ability to make so much money from these compounds was secured through strong intellectual property protection. There are three factors that make this configuration a structure that is potentially ridden with crisis. The place of the pharmaceutical industry in the speculative marketplace, pipeline problems, and the patent cliff. I elaborate. So most major R&D-driven pharmaceutical companies are publicly traded. This means that value for these companies is determined less by profit how much money they actually make over the amount expended, and more by growth, how much potential there is for future earnings over and above the present rate of earning, which can be translated into shareholder value. The financial community expects a pharmaceutical industry growth rate of 13% earnings per share, or EPS, annually. The industry growth rate is about 8% EPS. To reach even a 10% growth rate requires three to five new chemical entities to be approved each year. This is difficult to achieve. If only one in five drug candidates entering clinical trials makes it to market, then in order to generate three to five new chemical entities a year, one needs a large pipeline of drugs entering clinical trials. The absence of a robust pipeline in the pharmaceutical industry exacerbates the crisis. The pharmaceutical industry has, at least since the mid-1990s, faced what is referred to in the industry as an innovation deficit. For instance, in 1995, 75 of the top 100 drugs on the market targeted only four families of molecular targets. The number of drug targets addressed at the turn of the century was less than 450, compared to the roughly 10,000 targets that are estimated to exist in the human genome. 
Further, these targets were not medically very diverse. The crisis of the pipeline then exacerbates the structural crisis that already exists because of the relationship between the pharmaceutical industry and the speculative marketplace. In this situation, the one thing that saves pharmaceutical companies is the handful of blockbuster drugs that make billions of dollars a year. The only way these drugs are able to make so much money, however, is because they are protected by the monopoly afforded by the patent. Hence, intellectual property becomes the critical factor that allows value generation in this business model. This is where the phenomenon known in industry circles as the patent cliff becomes such a potential source of crisis. By 2012, it is estimated that drugs representing over $74 billion in sales will lose patent protection, and hence face the prospect of competition from generic manufacturers. This means that the pharmaceutical industry is in crisis from both directions, the looming expiration of patent monopolies on currently profitable drugs, and the lack of an adequate pipeline of new drugs to replace those that will start facing generic competition upon patent expiration. This leads to the recognition on the part of the pharmaceutical industry for near-term revenue and a resulting focus on mergers and acquisitions, M&A, rather than research and development, R&D. Hence, there are two tendencies that are consequent to the structure within which the pharmaceutical industry operates. The first are the monopolistic tendencies that arise through patent protection. The second is the tendency to consolidation through acquisitions. One also sees two types of risk here. The first is the risk of drug development itself, given its capital-intensive nature and high risk of failure. The second is the risk of being a player in capital markets. This includes the risk of not providing an adequate return on investment to shareholders, but also the risks attendant to responding to this through mergers and acquisitions. Yet, the calculation is that financial speculation provides insurance against the risks and uncertainties of drug development. Instead of going through a time-consuming, expensive, and uncertain research and development process, the tendency for the major pharmaceutical companies has increasingly been to use their capital to bet on another, usually smaller company's molecule that is further along in the pipeline, either in licensing that molecule or acquiring the company itself. This process of shifting corporate strategy more and more in terms of financial risk calculus, I argue, results in the complete separation of value from considerations of patient needs or good health. Indeed, the very definition of health now comes to be at stake and reconfigured in this process. What one is seeing now is the implicit understanding of health in terms of what Joseph Dumit has re referred to as surplus health. This is where health itself becomes abstracted from healthiness and operates purely as potential for the generation of surplus value in the manner that labor does when it becomes surplus labor in industrial capitalism. The shift in focus from an R&D-driven business model of pharmaceutical development to an M&A-driven one sees a resolute shift in the understanding of health as surplus health. And inversely, health has to be seen as a potential source of value if one is even to imagine making the kinds of speculative financial bets on it that one sees in this model of pharmaceutical development. This is because the bet that is made here is not one that has anything to do with healthiness or therapeutic efficacy. It is rather a bet on market size, market penetration, and the potential for market growth. It is a bet on therapeutic consumption which, in order to be a source of surplus value, must by definition be potentially greater than the amount of therapeutic consumption required to maintain healthiness. This creates a structure of crisis for patients. So let me talk about the structure of crisis for patients. I've argued so far, though all too briefly, that the structure within which the pharmaceutical industry operates is marked by crisis at multiple levels. This includes, to summarize, and some of these are things I haven't elaborated or even mentioned, but this is like the laundry list I have, the increasing complexity of therapeutic development itself, given that most low-hanging drug candidates have already been identified and there's been a move towards more rational drug development, the inherent uncertainty of the drug development process, depending as it ultimately does on unpredictable interactions between individual biochemical, mole between individual biochemical molecules and human physiologies, the resulting elaborate high-risk nature of the clinical trials process, the tendency of most R&D-focused pharmaceutical companies to be publicly traded in speculative markets, leading to pressures to answer to investors, the resulting growth calculus that drives the valuation of these companies, the innovation deficit that sees fewer and fewer drugs coming through the pipeline in the 2000s than in the 1990s, the patent cliff that sees enormous real and potential revenue losses because of the number of blockbuster drugs that are coming off patent, the inherent lack of organizational suppleness and flexibility within many large pharmaceutical companies that result in them being generally not particularly innovative, 
the conservativeness of venture capital in recent years that has resulted in greater difficulties for biotech companies, which tend to depend heavily on initial venture capital financing, um, the resulting shift in the focus of pharmaceutical companies away from R&D towards M&A, concomitant crisis for workers within the pharmaceutical industry who have faced large-scale retrenchment, and the further shift of the industry as a response to this crisis into logics dictated by speculative financial markets to the point where pharmaceutical companies themselves start functioning almost as investment banks, as de facto regulators often betters on capital flows while consolidating themselves into fewer and larger entities. This kind of structural configuration potentially creates crisis for patients at multiple levels. At a basic conceptual level, it does so because, as just argued, it shifts the pharmaceutical industry resolutely away from being in the business of healthiness to being in the business of health, where health itself gets redefined into something alienable and appropriable, a source of surplus value in a manner analogous to that by which labor became surplus labor under logics of industrial capital. Patients in this calculus have no meaning except as potential future consumers of therapy, leading to the imagination of patients as always already patients in waiting who are consumers in waiting. I tease out this logic in extremely schematic fashion next, and I want to talk first about the American patient consumer. So the innovation deficit that puts the pharmaceutical industry in crisis has been compensated for in the American context by a consumption surplus. This is because pharmaceutical companies need to grow their markets in order to create value for their investors. But they've been poor at growing markets by coming up with new drugs for new indications. Hence, American patients get imagined as consumers who can grow market if, markets if they can just consume more drugs. This has led to Americans become, become consuming more and more drugs, a process that is traced empirically by Dumit in his work, and to their becoming the world's most therapeutically saturated population. Um, don't laugh, this is an actor's category, therapeutic saturation, it's a real problem, it's why it's hard to conduct clinical trials in the US, because Americans are on too many drugs. Um, <laughs> given that drugs are fundamentally toxic molecules, this therapeutic saturation is not harmless, as seen most dramatically, for instance, in the case of Vioxx. This is where developing country contexts also become relevant. If one is considering an industry that operates within a value system that is fundamentally dependent on market growth, then one has to consider the various ways in which markets can be potentially grown. One way for a company to grow its market is to come out with a new therapeutic molecule, but this is time-consuming, expensive, and risky, and has not been as successful over the past decade as capital markets require. A second way is by expanding the indications for medications on the market through off-label use or, through re or to reframe diseases as chronic or requiring prophylactic and preventive intervention, which is the mechanism of surplus health generation that Dumit has described in his work. A third way in principle is to expand markets spatially, especially into emergent markets. This is harder to do for the pharmaceutical industry because of its concerns with protecting intellectual property, and this is where providing global security to companies' intellectual property through the World Trade Organization, um, the WTO, becomes important, and in maintaining control of their ability to set prices. It would not be politically viable for a pharmaceutical company to sell a patented drug at a relatively low price that could be afforded by, say, an Indian population, and at the same time sell it at an extremely high price in the US market. Therefore, including developing country populations within a global market calculus while attractive is variously constrained. However, value can be increased if the price of drug development is reduced. This is best achieved by reducing the cost of the clinical trials process through outsourcing the trials to the developing world. This does not require the developing world to be constituted as a market. One does not need to sell a drug in a country in which one tests a drug. I want to elaborate upon this logic of clinical trials and access to medicines with particular reference to India. So first clinical trials, and, and some context here first. India has over the past 40 years developed a thriving national pharmaceutical industry built on the, process of, on the basis of a process patent regime instituted in 1970, which did not allow patents on drug molecules, but only on the process by which they could be manufactured. Unlike many developing and indeed developed country contexts, India never instituted a system of nationalized health insurance or even a properly functioning system of government-imposed price controls on drugs. Hence, price regulation has been purely a function of the market. This means that the question of what kind of market is operational is utterly critical. There are two ways in which India has become incorporated into the globalization of drug development since the mid-1990s. 
One concerns the globalization of clinical trials, and the second concerns the global harmonization of intellectual property regimes under the WTO. Under the new regime, the Indian government had to allow product patents on drug molecules themselves. India implemented a new WTO-compliant product patent regime in 2005. This shift in patent regimes was happening at a time when globally, one was seeing the emergence of a new industry segment in biomedicine existing solely to conduct clinical trials and operationalized by companies called clinical research organizations or CROs. As clinical trials have moved more and more into the private sector in the US, a movement that began in the 1980s, these companies have come to constitute an autonomous sector within the drug development industry. Their locus of value, unlike that of the pharmaceutical companies, lies not even in the valorized expansion of health, but simply in the valorized expansion of pharmaceutical clinical trials. India is a potentially attractive destination for clinical trials because of the presence of low-cost, bioavailable experimental subject populations combined with good quality medical infrastructure. Since 2005, um, there has been a concerted effort by Indian actors to make India a global clinical trial hub. And so within the surplus health logics of biocapital as they expand globally, there are, I argue, two ways in which developing country populations such as in India are placed in situations of real or potential crisis. The first is through their exclusion from the therapeutic market, but their inclusion into global pharmaceutical clinical trials. In the establishment of a regulatory infrastructure for clinical trials, a process that has been driven largely by the Indian CRO industry, which hopes to attract global pharmaceutical clinical trials, there is enormous concern with laws that mandate adherence to good clinical practice, concerns such as institutional review boards, informed consent, monitoring and documentation of trial protocols, and so on. But there are no regulatory mechanisms to ensure that experimental drugs tested in India will be subsequently marketed in India, let alone be made available at affordable cost. Hence, the very imagination of trial populations in India is as merely risked experimental subjects without the implicit social contract of therapeutic access at the end of the day. This is a structural consequence of India's insertion into global surplus health logics. Layered onto this are the historical conditions of possibility that lead to the possibility of the configuration of such merely risked experimental subjectivities in the first place. I've described in earlier work how the kinds of subjects who get recruited into especially early stage clinical trials on healthy volunteers in India are often those who are victims of other kinds of prior dispossession. Examples include mill workers in Bombay who have worked in textile mills like that, um, who have lost their jobs because of the evisceration of the textile industry, or more recently, diamond workers in Surat who are following similar trajectories of deproletarianization leading to experimental subjectivity. The clinical trial situation represents a constitutive condition of exclusion from the therapeutic market in order to be enrolled as experimental subjects for drugs that others consume. This reflects the fact that India has cheap bioavailable bodies and these logics of bioavailability where Indian subjects are not consumers but rather laboring bodies and circuits of biocapital are also seen in the ways in which India has been emerging as a global destination for surrogacy. And the parallels between clinical trials economies and the economies of global reproductive politics are essential to think about here. But there's also the simultaneous fact that India is a country with a burgeoning consumer class and constitutes an emerging market of enormous potential. In this register, there is a desire to include India into a global pharmaceutical market imaginary. Hence, the very same pharmaceutical company logics that make it attractive to outsource clinical trials to developing country locations like India also make it attractive to imagine India as a potential pharmaceutical market. These two logics are disaggregated in the regulatory calculus of the Indian state, since clinical trials regulation has been driven by the local CRO industry in apparent disregard for considerations of therapeutic consumption, let alone access. But the manner in which they play out from the perspective of value logics of capital needs to be discussed next in terms of impacts on access to medicines. So the imagination of countries like India as a potential therapeutic market by the Western pharmaceutical industry is constrained by one important factor and conditioned by another. The condition is a stringent intellectual property regime, which is what these companies now have post WTO. This allows companies a monopoly and allows them to set prices as they would in the US or Europe, which is essential for them to do in order to protect their high prices in those primary markets. But it is precisely this that limits how much countries like India can be imagined as markets at all, since this necessarily leads to the pricing of many patented therapeutics beyond what many Indian patients can afford. This potentially puts Indian populations into crisis in another register, 
the denial of access to many essential medicines for large sections of the Indian population that might, they might have been able to afford under a previous process patent regime, not because of market exclusion, but because of the inclusion of India into a global neoliberal market regime that operates through surplus health logics that require the establishment of monopolistic business models at the expense of the free market competition that prevailed earlier. Drug prices under monopoly regimes are likely to be significantly higher than those under a regime of free market competition, especially if the monopolistic price point is one that is identical to the price point set in the US. So, for instance, Novartis's anti-cancer drug Gleevec was being priced up to 30 times higher than the price at which Indian companies were already selling generic versions of the drug. India's insertion into a surplus health economy also means that it puts the Indian generic industry potentially in crisis. Historically, the opening up of smaller pharmaceutical economies has tended to eviscerate national industry, as seen, for instance, with both the Italian and the Spanish industries in the 1980s. One is already seeing this trend in the Indian industry. Indeed, larger Indian companies have emerged as attractive acquisition targets for multinational pharmaceutical companies, not least because of their generic capabilities that are potentially attractive to leverage for revenues by acquiring companies in post-patent cliff scenarios in the West. Hence, there is a movement whereby Indian companies are shifting from being the manufacturers of bulk drugs as commodities for sale in Indian markets to becoming effectively outsourced manufacturing facilities for multinational pharmaceutical companies. That is, if they're not going out of business entirely. The progressive acquisition or evisceration of the Indian industry is consequential not just for Indian patients, but for patients throughout the developing world, especially when it comes to access to essential medications such as antiretrovirals. For instance, Doctors Without Borders procure 75% of its essential medicines for worldwide distribution from India. So the stakes for drug access globally are acute. So this is my summary of all these crises. Now, conclusion. Right. So to conclude, <clears throat> at the start of the Grundrisse, Marx analyzes the banking crisis of 1855. In other words, Marx's initial forays into coming up with a larger structural account of the functioning of capital begins, as his work often does, conjuncturally. In his analysis, Marx engages in a polemic against socialists who attribute the crisis to the malfeasance of the banks and who thereby imply that the solution to the crisis would involve reforming the banks. Marx responds by showing that, in fact, the so-called malfeasance of the banks is simply the case of banks acting like, well, banks. Um, in other words, what is critical for Marx is an understanding of the crisis in structural terms. Structure in this case it concerns an elucidation, first, of the value logics of capital, and second, of the ways in which institutional actors historically came to be captured within those value logics, so that it became both sensible and apparently natural for these actors to act in the interests of capital. This necessarily leads to crisis, not just because of the interests of capital invariably involve alienation, expropriation, and exploitation, but because left to itself, capital cannot set itself limits, and hence ends up putting its own institutions in crisis. This is what happened with the banks in 1855. It's what's happened with the banks in 2008. I'm trying to make an analogous analytic movement, last paragraph, um, in order to understand the dynamics of the pharmaceutical industry. This is an industry that is itself in crisis, and I want to trace the historical tendencies towards privatization, leading to an appropriation of health itself by capital, and towards speculation, which have put this industry in crisis. But I also want to show how these tendencies lead to the unfolding of geographical trajectories, not just historical ones. In the process, the attempts to respond to pharmaceutical crisis lead, on the one hand, to larger, even more speculative industries, thereby reinforcing the very conditions that led to the crisis in the first place. And on the other hand, this leads to the globalization of the crisis, implicating people and industries in other parts of the world. What crisis might mean is different for different actors, and this difference also precludes the possibility of easy solidarity and makes it difficult to understand the ways in which, for instance, there is a structural relationship between an American who has died because of the side effects of Vioxx, which has everything to do with things like off-label use and therapeutic saturation, and an Asian, African, or Latin American patient who has died because she could not afford essential anti-cancer or anti-retroviral medication that could have allowed her to live and for which manufacturing capacity at an affordable cost already exists. But any adequate critical and political response to this crisis has to understand the ways in which health itself has come to be redefined through its appropriation by a globalizing speculative capital and has to insist upon an imagination and institutionalization of a form of health that resists such appropriation. Thanks.
when I found Kaushik's paper in my email box uh, Monday morning, it was uh, 30 pages single space long, and I thought, how on earth is Kaushik going to do this? And I must say, he's uh, covered most of the paper, um, except for a couple of the historical things that are important at the beginning. But I thought, you know, how will he do this, and what can I do sort of in response to such a large paper, sort of given that I thought he had to make a bet on what part he would speak on? So I second-guessed him and um, picked out an aspect of the paper that I will develop a comment on. And interestingly, it anticipates you know, many things that uh, Michael's paper was addressing as well. And so you know, miraculously, I have produced a response to this paper as well, which I will just at the end of my comments of clarify in a little bit of more of an oral fashion. But let me begin. So I've given my comments a title, uh, and it's a little bit of a jibe with um, uh, with Moish Postone, I call it the spirit of capitalism redux. So Kaushik Sundarajan's paper is a wonderful exemplar of Marx-inspired dialectical thinking in the service of exploring institutional dynamics across time, space, and domains of social life. In the long version of this paper, he effortlessly connects consumers, producers, test persons, entrepreneurs, managers, venture capitalists, legislators, regulators, researchers, venture capitalists, private equity owners, and corporate raiders on two continents. He is dealing in the epistemics of pharmaceutical research as much as in the epistemics of market participation and government intervention. He is concerned with capital flows as much as with the exchange of knowledge, and he analyzes the risk and uncertainty structure of the participants involved. Among these many interconnections, the paper focuses in its back part on the consequences of India's increasing integration into a number of different world markets and its front part on the business logic of the Western pharma industry after the biotechnical revolution. Replicating the tone of Marxist analysis of mid-19th century capitalism, Kaushik tells us that all components, all components of this vast institutional fabric are in crises. Big Pharma is shown to be suffering from the merciless profitability targets of speculative investors. Research is presented as stifled by short-term financial horizons. Some patients are presented as ill from overprescription and overconsumptions, others as ill from blocked access to vital medications. In the world that Kaushik depicts, everybody is under duress. Everybody has reason to be profoundly unhappy in a veritable madhouse of institutional interactions which has the uncanny ability to turn even the best of intentions into unfavorable outcomes. A good example for this are legislative efforts putatively in the service of the interests of some population at large are shown by Kaushik to play an integral part in the frightening dynamics he depicts. More concretely, the time horizons for patents leading to the cost-effective availability of some drugs are part and parcels of the story why prices are so crazy for other kinds of medications. India's economic liberalization, even though an integral part of that, company's bo- that country's boom um, in pharmaceutical production, is also a scrooge for the very same middle-class patients who might find better-paying jobs in these firms because it leaves them without supplies of medicines which were well in their reach before the reform. Kaushik's deepest desire is to understand how such a madhouse could replicate itself in the course of time, if not as a self-similar arrangement of institutions, for the world he describes is and will remain in considerable flux, but in its sheer, seemingly inescapable madness in which everybody remains in crisis. For such an analysis, Kaushik needs to make a bet on what matters more and what matters less in the world he describes. Rather than falling into the trap of technological determination, he bets, and I think quite rightly, on the worldwide market for investment capital. Unfortunately, Kaushik qualifies the part of this market relevant to his project with the post-Foucauldian prefix bio, into the market for bio-capital. While most of us share the assessment that capital markets have assumed central role in today's economy, it is a mistake, I think, to qualify capital as deeded to specific purposes. Luckily, this remains rather inconsequential for his actual analysis because he is more concerned with the effects of the operations of the capital market on the pharmaceutical industry and its clients than with this market itself. 
And yet, precisely because it assumes such a central pacemaking role in his analysis, I would like to comment, starting from Kaushik's descriptions, on some of the changing dynamics in the capital markets over the last three decades. And I hope that this will connect us to the previous panel, which unfortunately I had to miss. So there might be some replication that is unwanted on my part. Kaushik describes a salient effect of the capital markets on the management of pharmaceutical firms as a high and it seems ever increasing demand for total returns on investment. Managers' efforts to meet these expectations take on the role of first mover in Kaushik's model. Meeting these demands governs business strategy, product and market development, mergers and acquisitions, etc. What such a demand means is that terming even consistent profits is not enough to survive in a world where other companies in the same sector or other branches of economic pursuit offer apparently higher returns. Here Kaushik rightly turns to Marx because the operations of capital markets appear to epitomize Marx's old formula for capital, that is MCM prime, money invested in some mediating market transactions indexed by Marx as commodity, leading to more money, that is in modern business speak, returns on investment. The whole point of Marx, or capital a la Marx, is pure fungibility of capital and the shrewd attention to differential returns of the capitalist. The absence of advanced qualifications fixing investments into particular pursuits is precisely what lends Marxian capital its dynamism. For capital, the quality of the mediating market involvement the kind of commodity used en route to returns on investment does not matter. All that counts is the relative size of the accrual returned. The poignancy of Marx for the current moment rests precisely in the fact that in his analysis, money becomes completely self-referential. That is an end in itself. Kaushik, Kaushik speaks in the context of product um, produced by the pharmaceutical industry as an abstracted form of health. What matters is not the tangible healthiness, as he says, of human beings, but their net present value as consumers of medications administered over a lifetime. Medicines are not here to cure ailments, but people as potential consumers of medications are vehicles to produce returns on investments. Of course, this operation this way of looking at buyers of commodities is characteristic for any kind of product manufactured under the logic of capital. Pharmaceuticals or medical services make only particularly obvious the moral maxim of behavior, which is the exact reverse of Kant's categorical imperative. Marxian capital demands that the other be possible, the, uh, sorry, Marxian capital demands that the other be treated at all times as a means to the end of highest possible returns on investment. So we have the old objectification story here, albeit with a shift of emphasis from the commodification of labor to the objectification of the buyer as consumer. Two things strike me as worth noting in this, at this point. First, many parts of the economy in which we live today are not capitalistic in the Marxian sense. Joe the plumber is only a capitalist to the degree that he is not somehow wedded to plumbing as a life-fulfilling pursuit. In fact, much of what we used to call entrepreneurship is not capitalistic in this Marxian sense at all. The gentleman book publisher who was interested not only in books but in particular authors, he aimed to promote the machine tool manufacturer used to be an engineer with a particular product idea to which she was typically dedicated for other reasons than sheer monetary gain. This kind of product entrepreneurship contrasts with pure market entrepreneurship, which aims at returns no matter what the pursuit. The libidinal economy, the aesthetics at work in either of these two pursuits are very different. In practice, both types of entrepreneurship are easily mixed, however. What is important is that with growing investment needs, however, product entrepreneurship typically becomes a function of market entrepreneurship. So what we have seen during the last 30 years, product entrepreneurship has lost considerable ground vis-a-vis -vis pure market entrepreneurship. 
Management that fails to act in a market entrepreneurial fashion will soon find itself a target for passable takeovers because market entrepreneurs see, it, see in it a potential for what they consider to be value creation, which is just another word for higher returns to investors. My point is simply this. The publishers gain in meaning by publishing particular authors who are not as profitable as others is a loss to the investor and can for that reason not be tolerated by Marxian type capitalists. Investors are supposed to be in the market for solely one reason, returns. And so, for example, gentlemen publishers have become mere labels of multinational media companies. Sports car manufacturers have become brands of world's automotive giants. To sum up my first point, what we have witnessed in the last 30 years is a quantum leap in the capitalization of the economy in a Marxian sense. Second, along with shifting understandings of economic life as prior, primarily capitalistic in a Marxian sense, came changes in the kind and precision of metrics used to gauge the value of investments and with it investing success. And with these new metrics came new metricians, experts in measuring returns over varying temporal horizons. First among these are so-called financial analysts who are typically working for some stock brokering agency. And then there are investment bankers acting as issuing agents or takeover brokers. And finally, there are business consultants teaching managers how to be better capitalists in a Marxian sense. Moreover, the object of measurement, the source from which the return on investment were expected, shifted away in the last 30 years from income generated through dividends to focus much more on stock price appreciation. Stock prices in turn became less a function of current economic performance as much more a question of meeting and exceeding expectations. And these expectations were in turn formed in view of the longer run potential of a particular kind of investment measured in terms of net present values, NPVs for short. That is discounted future cash flows. The hallmark of this approach is to make bets on the future of products and the corporations manufacturing and selling them. Thus, the analysis or soothsaying, or guesstimation of the future becomes not only part and parcel of, but the central part of investment decisions. The aforementioned metricians of returns have de facto entered the business of futurologists. This focus on future returns has had profound repercussions on managerial work. For a long time, products have been sold by wrapping them in fantasies. That is total old head. But now corporations, even whole industries, had to be sold. And by selling them, they had to be wrapped in fantasies too. Making these fantasies credible through performances has become an important task for management. The prevalence of capital in a Marxian sense has created the acute necessity of a management by appearances, hope to wield performative effects realizing themselves in kinds of self-fulfilling prophecies. Today's quest for the charismatic CEO is no longer the quest of a captain of industry. Instead, it is a quest for so-called visionaries. Steve Jobs of Apple fame is the embodiment of this new capital-driven managerial type. What we have then Taking in view the dialectical co-constitution between Marxian capitalization and its metricization is an archetypical Weberian process of rationalization. We have the systematization, systematization of investment as a particular pursuit supported by new types of specialists and performers. This is at the same time a process of disenchantment and a process of re-enchantment. The enchantment of the link between an entrepreneur and his or her product, the belief of a publisher in his author or of an engineer in her technology, had to give way to the enchantment not with money itself. You know, that has always been around. But the enchantment with the idea of more and more money. 
the enchantment with the very idea of capital as formulated by Marx. Nothing speaks more eloquently to this than the ever new heights we see in managerial compensation. Of course, this sounds all awfully familiar. In a way, I'm asking again where the spirit of capitalism comes from. What I should have said, therefore, is that we have witnessed is a process of further rationalization of investment and a renewed enchantment with the idea of capital. For me, this raises two questions. First, what led to the hiatus in the earlier rationalization process of investment? And second, what reignited it? In answer to the first question, I have nothing much to offer but a somewhat lame pointer to the emergence of the welfare state. In answer to the second question, I have, as of yet, no more and no less than a laundry list of developments which strike me as having contributed cumulatively in a mutually amplifying way to the reintroduction and reinstitutionalization of the spirit of capitalism. The one that is especially highlighted by Kaushik is the sheer size of investments necessary today to get into certain types of product development. Of course, as he points out, development cost numbers aired publicly are an integral part of the political rhetoric around the pricing for pharmaceuticals. And yet, nobody doubts that given current technologies and current regulatory practices, very large outlays are necessary in the pharmaceutical industry as well as in many others. Size matters in other ways too. The market capitalization of firms is such that some of the largest private equity deals today have the very volume of state budget. Yet, we are not merely looking at a size phenomenon here, a dialectical leap from quantitative variations to qualitative change. The final victory of business schools <coughs> over engineering schools as sources for managerial staff plays a role and with it new managerial ideologies, notably the very idea of shareholder value as the ultimate guiding principle of managerial decisions um, as it came to be prevalent in corporate boardrooms to this new type of manager. And that contributed significantly to the rekindling of the renewed spirit of capitalism. In this context, I only want to point to Milton Friedman's much noted essay published in the New York Times Magazine in 1970, The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Its Profits. Yes? In that essay, he urges managers to forget any talk about the social responsibilities of business indeed focusing instead on nothing but the financial interests of shareholders, which pulls the social good automatically in its wake, as Friedman argued, not surprisingly. As far as I can tell from the lively debate about that essay, it marks the starting point of the victory march of shareholder value as the dominant managerial ideology. Of course, it could assume this import only because it deeply resonated with other developments in the sense of offering guidance of what to do. Important among these are the succession problems of a whole generation of World War II entrepreneurs running medium-sized family-owned businesses. These transition problems started to surface in the beginning of the 1970s, amounting to crisis proportions in the 1980s. Succession cases became in turn the practicing ground for what later would be called corporate raiders, who, whose targets became fast, much bigger, leading um, to the iconic mega deals of the 1980s, uh, such as TWA and Revlon. Unsurprisingly, these new owners, beholden to their own investors, brought with them a fierce belief in shareholder value, striking the fear into the rest of the corporate world. None of this would have been possible without newly liberalized banks, of course. Um, and uh, they enabled uh, hostile takeovers conducted in the interest of shareholder value creation. Other developments fueled this trend. First, oil dollars, and then the conversion of old age provisioning from employer-based pension funds into 401k-type plans created new demands for investment opportunities. The latter turned the majority of the American population into small-scale stock owners with a lively interest in participating in successive boom cycles, promising cushy retirement prospects. This conversion of retirement funds was ideologically facilitated by the new rise of mutual fund 
sanctified by financial economists as the best long-term investment available. This mass involvement into seemingly safe and sane investment strategies was further amplified by the availability of news media peddling the latest development of stock indices as barometers of economic health. Let me conclude. I do not think that we can understand the operation and transformation of such vast institutional precipitates as economies, societies, or polities without analyzing the ways in which people understand their own participation in these institutions. When I say understand, I have in mind a whole notion of what this includes, a very wide notion, particularly not only our discursive, but certainly also our emotive, kinesthetic, and sensual understandings of these worlds. Of course, we need very concrete analysis of understandings and their institutional sources and consequences. I also believe that we cannot analyze the operation and transformation of large institutional arrangements without recognizing the concurrent plurality of different and often also alternative modes of operation which, with, whose relative prevalence shifts in the course of time. We need a fine-grained analysis how such understandings gain or lose plausibility in the course of time in the face of the experiential environment in which people live. If we want to understand contemporary economic life in the US, for example, we urgently need to have an eye not only, therefore, onto the vastly changed environment in which managers and bankers operate today and the kinds of theories they mobilize and the kinds of emotions they have acting in their world. We also need an eye on how and to what end the top two-thirds of the entire society, the top two-thirds income earners in this country participate in the investment markets. We need to comprehend how they relate to the mass-mediated discourses about money, investment, and risk if we want to grasp how the new spirit of capitalism could become so effective and as pervasive as it has become. We need to acknowledge that most of us are implicated in many more than the obvious ways in the kinds of madness Kaushik has so vividly described to us. So again, another déjà vu. We are implicated in our own present objectification as consumers as sources of investment returns for a seemingly better future. Hope for change must be rekindled through an analysis of how we contribute through our own actions to the reproduction of particular kinds of institutions. The analysis must come down from the abstract description of structures to the understandings and actions constituting them. The social sciences as well as the social and political philosophy, no matter of what stripe, have failed us in this regard. They have either operated with a leisure domain assertion of human freedom or they have engaged in a curious fetishization of structure. The crisis, whatever it is, has also something to do with our failed representations and their understanding imaginaries of the social world. Thank you. So um, line up for questions. Let's let's take at least at least twenty minutes for the Q and A. Yes, um, I've spent quite a bit of my um, educational career uh, trying to write and teach uh, Marx's theory of value, and uh, this panel uh, I think is a is a wonderful illustration of uh, a lot of the key points that the theory of value is. Uh, addresses, and in a certain sense it outlines what I would call the content of the theory of value. Um, and uh, I uh, really encourage people who are interested in these kind of problems to review that theory, um, and particular the parts of it that have to do with how uh, surplus value appears as a pool for the whole economy, how claims uh, on it for um, income flows such as rent, and the, which sustains the, the price of land, um, have nothing to do with the actual creation of value and the creation of surplus value, and the part of it that, uh, that distinguishes between productive and unproductive labor and tries to um, argue uh, 
uh, and shows in a rigorous fashion um, where the incomes of unproductive uh, labor come from. I, I, I really think that's going to help clarify a lot uh, of uh, the analytical point. Um, you may think that there is another theory of value, in particular because uh, mainstream economics calls its theory of equilibrium price a theory of value. But, and it may surprise you a little bit, but I'd just like to warn you that you're wrong. There, <laughs> there is no other theory of value. The, the uh, mainstream theory of equilibrium price cannot answer these types of questions. And it focuses on an entirely different question, which is the generation of economic surpluses through voluntary um, exchange. And if you follow that out, uh, you'll find that you cannot make any coherent discussion of where the profits of pharmaceuticals come, actually come from or um, the questions that Michael was raising about where, uh, what finance actually does and where the incomes of financial uh, institutions come from. That's a comment. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask a question about uh, possible uh, theoretical uh, possible theoretical possibilities of reconceiving the private sector entity as something other than it is an amoral nihilistic uh, sort of uh, uh, construct that is out to uh, to maximize uh, profits for the shareholders. And I come at this with a bit of a frustration personally. I'm not an academic. I'm an entrepreneur who has been trying to set up business models for responsible and ethical diamond mining projects in West Africa. Uh, and uh, it's been, no matter how ethical and how uh, well-intentioned we have been, uh, we found that the frustration is that these folks are living on top of billions of dollars of, uh, of wealth, yet they're basically living on about a dollar a day. And the challenge was how can you increase the multiplier effect in the economy, pay them more, and have it be of some real value, and yet, uh, and, and not to have, a, and to, to basically help reduce poverty. And it was a very uh, much a challenge because regardless of how much of a percentage of our profits, we kicked back to the community for economic development and how much in terms of living wages we offered instead of just minimum wages. There, we found ourselves that we're living in a context that uh, we don't have real meaningful partnerships with the private sector, with the public sector in those countries where infrastructure was being built and there was no institutions. The institutions were so weak. So the, really, basically, the conclusion we came up with is that it's not just about the intentions and the formulas and the business plans, but it's also about coming up with the proper partnerships with the public sector, uh, labor unions, labor organizations, and even the civil society. And to that, I think there is no simple, pithy ideological answer. It's hard work of trial and experimentation and trying to work it out. Uh, so what I'm thinking is that, how, what are the limits of theorizing about this and how much of it is just about getting out there and doing and doing experimentations and doing a learning curve? And also, what can we do theoretically to reconceive the private sector as something else? One of you should begin responding to this. Why don't you start? Yeah, please start. Yeah. Um, so, so to the to the question, so to Andreas as well, or how, how did? No, just to talk. okay, okay. Um, in, in in response to the uh, well, well uh, Duncan, thank you for your comment, mm -hmm. and that's uh, you know, it's it's something that that I agree with entirely, and and um, in a longer conversation, I can. Um, re testify to the absolute importance of going back to Marx repeatedly in terms of understanding value. Um, in, in the question of the possibilities for conceiving the private sector entities in other ways, um, I would make maybe three suggestions, and all of them flow from one particular point which, which Marx suggests implicitly or explicitly at various points, which is and, and it's a point that has to do with understanding what the agency of capital is, because capital is something that is that does operate apparently autonomously, but it requires capitalists to operate it, right? There are people behind. And, and, and what, what he's interested in often is how capitalists are captured by logics of capital. 
So, so you know, I mean, just as uh, Edward was kind of uh, talking against this idea that it's about greed, um, I too would, you know, I, I too would speak against. I mean, this is not about evil pharmaceutical companies, right? And and that's often the discourse that one hears amongst activists and so on. There are ways in which people in this industry are captured by certain logics that make it sensible for them to act in the way that they do and where they're constrained from acting in other kinds of ways because it would be dumb. And so there are at least three things that I would want to point to here as sites to look at, right? One thing that makes it difficult to conceive private sector entities in other ways is when companies get enrolled more and more into speculative markets. And, and historically that's happened in the US pharmaceutical industry, of course, but it is happening right now in the Indian industry. So it's not just a function of Indian companies being sitting ducks that are ready to be acquired by Western companies. It's also Indian, it's also the stock market becoming more and more important in India, and therefore it becoming attractive for Indian companies to make themselves acquisition targets, and not attractive for them to stick to a kind of certain nationalist, anti-imperialist, we're making drugs for the people line. Um, the only company that's still doing that is Sipla, which is a family-run company run by Yusuf Hamid, whose father started this company, and he's run it for 50 years, and there's integral sort of insertion into the histories of anti-colonial struggles and so on. Right? The second thing to look at is regulation as a site here. Right? So I can't remember where, but Marx has this really poignant passage where he's talking about um, British industrialists who are actually begging the government to regulate against child labor. Because if they don't, then there's absolutely no way in which, you know, we don't want child labor, but we can't not employ children because it wouldn't make sense for us not to unless you stop us. And so there is a real kind of importance to thinking about regulation and, and regulation in certain progressive ways. And the third thing that I would want to say is that I don't think we can conceive of private sector entities in other ways until and unless we have an active political program to reinvigorate the public sector. And, and one of the real problems in the Indian pharmaceutical industry, I think, is that the government actively um, eviscerated the public sector pharmaceutical industry, which existed in the 1960s, and decided that price controls effectively could be a function of how the market played out. And then, of course, when the nature of the market changes, you have, you have no sorts of security, and the conversation of a public sector pharmaceutical industry is not even on the table in India now. It's essential for it to be on the table, not just in India, but everywhere else. It's essential for, greater public, for there to be greater public funding of clinical trials. And so if you recalibrate the entire structure where the state actually plays an active role in resisting appropriation by act, having control and ownership, and this was something alluded to earlier today, then you reconfigure the terrain upon which appropriability and the extents of it can be imagined, I think. Um, that, that was really good. You did a an great answer. So instead of answering then, I'd want to ask you a question, which is um, <laughs> I'm wondering what, the, uh, what your work would say, how it would allow you to talk about contemporary conceptions of development. And I'm thinking mostly of the NGO discourse in Africa, but I assume that there's similar discourses in India. I mean, I'm thinking primarily of the um, millennial villages that I know in Kenya, and I assume they're elsewhere in Africa, the Jeffrey Sachs organized things, mm -hmm. and the Gates Foundation. So in, here, in both, the, the discourse of development has shifted, of course, you know, they no longer talk about GDP. It, poverty is nominally the focus of the World Bank too, but really, their real discourse is about life slash health. Um, and that seems to me an interesting intersection with your, and in fact, I, I feel comfortable talking about biocapitalism, um, even if you don't, but uh, of course I do. <laughs> but here, biodevelopment also would make sense of this. Um, I mean, in the sense that the development, that the, now I'm, I'm, I was, you know, I'm, I'm posing a specific limit and I'm sort of thinking about, but it's interesting and useful, I think. What are the, what is the conception of development that's functional within the NGO perspective. I mean that, or, or even in the sometimes the World Bank perspective, that's a, it's a similar one. But I'm wondering what, how that relates to what mm -hmm. to your thinking about the Indian health. Mm -hmm. You don't have to answer. Would you answer? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> but, 
I mean, I could. It de- depends on whether you Go want ahead. to take. No, no, no. no. Yeah. Okay, so so so, so 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 a couple of a, a couple of quick things here, which is that one of the things that I'm trying to trace in this paper, and it's what I know empirically, is a particular kind of institutional logic that by no means is representative of the entire spectrum of biopolitical logics that are operational here, right? And so what what I am not talking about, well, there are at least two things that I'm not talking about that are very important. One is what you're alluding to, which is public health in the broadest sense, Mm -hmm. right? Which operates through certain other kinds of logics, including importantly actuarial logics and insurance and so on, Mm -hmm. um, care of the population in a way that this is not about. And also, um, which wasn't in your question, but closely related to public health logics, the security logics. Right. right, and the apparatus of the securitization well, and development, and, and, is and, 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 and development is closely linked to that. So there are, you know, I mean, those are other trajectories that have to be thought about that that some people are thinking about mm-hmm. in in very important ways. But I don't want to fold them up into this story because they're, they're different kinds of logic. Suffice to say that um, public health in India w- was not institutionalized until this government, in that there were no schools of public health in India until three years ago. Right, and there's been an active sort of attempt to institutionalize public health in this government, the Congress government. But of course, it's been a form of institutionalization that's been mediated heavily by Gates. So if you actually look at public health infrastructures on the ground in terms of you know, who's on the advisory body of the public, New Public Health Foundation of India institutions and so on and so forth, that whole kind of Gates apparatus is very, very important. Um, it is not the only NGO discourse, though. So, so in the context of Africa, for instance, this discourse is very, very important, the sort of Gates-led discourse. But um, my friend and former colleague at UC Irvine, Chris Peterson, has done a lot of work looking at the political economy of, um, of um, global aid for access to drugs in, in West Africa. Mm-hmm. And, and she finds that you can't go very far without, again, bringing Marx in, because the very conditions of possibility of global aid are predicated on um, prior dispossession and what she calls an emptying out of material space that happened in West Africa in the 1980s through structural adjustment. And that makes it even possible to imagine these kinds of aid configurations. But that's a brief answer to yeah. a longer conversation. Yeah, um, <clears throat> if I could, I'd just like to maybe bring things back to politics, as Gramsci suggests that Machiavelli often does, and, and importantly. Um, and specifically to ask the, the speakers, um, you know, what politics might look like, um, a, a, kind of polit- a kind of antagonistic politics or a, or a politics of resistance that's been sort of talked about m- much of the day. Um, but not in terms of its absence and not in terms of its sort of uh, violent populist forms and also not of, in terms of it to come, um, but politics now. And, and just as a f- kind of footnote, um, you know, we've talked about sort of the shadow of the uh, place of emergence of neoliberalism being across the, the courtyard. Um, and it might also be sort of worth noting that uh, Chicago is sort of one of the, the cities that has had the sort of highest numbers of evictions and foreclosures um, in the wake of the crisis. And at, as we are sitting here, there's a number of organizations um, in Chicago that are uh, busy helping a family occupy their own house such that they've been just evicted. So just to kind of think about politics and yeah, sort of this framework. Yeah. Oh, this? Um, pardon me? Yeah, are we collecting? Okay, well, okay let's collect. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, I just, I, two, two thoughts on um, the first talk. Uh, one, the logic of the factory, I just wonder, uh, you know, and, and the whole idea of imposing the logic of the factory on something else, I just, I wonder to what extent there is a logic of the factory and whether or not a kind of more Marxian category wouldn't, wouldn't just be the, uh, you know, value and the whole, I mean, he, Marx has the whole language of subsumption, different types of subsumption, 
uh, you know, formal, real, etc. And uh, it seems to me like that's too concrete. Um, and then the whole idea of industrial too. I mean, what, what, what? So what's in the whole category of industrial capital? What really is that conceptually? And does it really turn on whether you're producing stuff or whether you're producing codes or something like that? I don't think it does it turn on that. I'll just say that, say that much. But I think the whole, I mean, I think you raised the, the basic thrust of the talk, you raised uh, with that, that, that kind of falsifying the image. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it, it, it puts a great uh, question on the table, which is, which is the measure. And you kept coming back to the question of the, the measure. So I, I think that, that really, I think, is the, the big question. Uh, uh, we live in a society where we have value and really surplus value and rates of surplus value and expected rates of surplus value. These are, these are sort of really the normative measures. And so the question really raises the, that question of an alternative, though. I think just one caveat, though, is I think a bit of a problem is that it seems to prejudice the case on the measure. I mean, coin, you think of what would you, if you put something new on it, it's as if you put a different quantity, as if, as, as if we're giving the wrong quantities. So the idea that there's some kind of quantitative measure, you know, you get that in various utility theories and so forth, I think that takes us in the wrong direction. So I think mm -hmm. that's a kind of problem with it. Okay, so we have one more question in line. Do you want to give that question now and then I'll turn to the panel? Thanks. How you doing? Yeah. First I want to give a shout out to my white niggas. John and Jean Comeron from Lauren Berlin, who 20 years ago helped Don Matthews get a PhD from here. So. <laughs> I want to say a few, a few a months ago, I landed in a jail in Michigan because I refused to go along with uh, the police stopping me driving my blocks. The thing that I learned there, though, I think directly has to say something about what you guys have been saying. What I met there were lower class, white, black, brown, and red brothers who were making their money easing the pain. You understand what I'm saying? Medical marijuana, they were, they were growing marijuana, they were experts in, in chemistry, and, you know, because the, the present economic system had displaced them, and their only way of, of making a living was to turn to Ill illegal substances. I spent the last year working as a chaplain in the, in the second wealthiest county in the United States where folks had access to medical care, no problem. But when we did the research in terms of where do people go when they have private medical problems, to, to non-traditional medicine. They don't go to the, to the pharmacy. They can't afford them. They don't believe them, et cetera. So I just want to, to uh, sometimes often, uh, us good Marxists and socialists forget about what's, what's happening on the, on the common ground. What's, how, how do people make it? How do people ease their pain in times of, of social economic crisis? Okay. Thank you, that's fantastic. Mm. So. Uh, I mean, I think I can start. Uh, I mean, what I guess what I'm what I'm interested in trying to do here, at least in the center of what I was saying, was um, returning again. I mean, the way Marx would talk about it, I suppose, about the analysis of class composition, even the technical composition of the working class. Like, just asking, well, what do people do today? And look at you know, in, in a way, with the idea, the assumption that it's not the same as what people did. Previously, like that, we have to each in each in each period conduct a new investigation and query of of class composition, and then on the basis of that, um, conduct. So it's on, when the bring it back to politics. At least one way, I can't see where you are now, but um, at least one way of imagining what possibilities for struggle are and for political struggle are is would be through um, the the power like rec the power of labor but not assuming the forms of labor politics that we've inherited like looking at what the composition of labor is today and seeing on that basis what its powers are and 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 conducting at least certain form of political struggle on that i don't mean to say that labor is the only possibility of politics that it's that it should eclipse all others or you know subordinate others but rather that that is at least one and the kind of one that I was, that I was interested in here today. Um, and, and also that it, to go to what you said before about that when people ask you to theorize alternativity and you look at what people are already doing, actually what Don said is really important. That is there are already informal economies where people are distributing labor and value and materials for the reproduction of life in ways that aren't a part of, and, and of course they get 
pushed into the informal economy, so you can't be utopian about it because right. because it's de it's a different kind of desperation. But also learning from what that kind of lateral form of production is like is an important part of the reorganization of labor power, potentially. Right. No, that that that, that definitely makes sense, and it's also why I sometimes um, envy anthropologists because the. The work is so much about that, what do we call it, like low-flying theorizations, you know, ones that, that start from what people are already doing mm -hmm. and work with that. Um, I want to, I mean, my, my uh, uh, it's true that my primary way of thinking about this was about measure. But that's where, with Duncan, I mean, I, I, I agree too that it's extraordinarily useful for me to continue going back to Marx's theory of value. There's one, this aspect of it, of course, uh, which I don't think is inextricable or essential, but Marx has a uh, strictly quantitative explanation of the relationship between you know, the quantity of abstract labor, a temporal quantity relationship between abstract labor time and, and uh, the production of value, and which I think, I might, you know, one could hypothesize that Marx does primarily about constructing a political struggle over the length of the working day and a way of, of having that relate to that, but I would say for me, to, for it to be useful with the kind of, at least the way I'm conceiving this analysis of value, would have to, not abstract from, uh, relate differently to that notion of quantity. That's what, that, that would be the kind of change, which, like I say, it doesn't, uh, it's, it's at least the form in which Marx conducts that, it conducts that discussion about labor and the relationship between labor and value. In a way, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pose a similar relation between labor and value, or really the same relation between labor and value, but saying that labor, at least the dominant forms of labor, have changed, and trying to relate how. So it's in a way not um, destroying a labor theory of value, but posing a different notion of the labor theory of value, or recognize as labor, in fact, in many cases, what has not previously been recognized as labor. Well, Does I that make sense? I, I was going to close down, but uh, Moish raised his hand, so. <laughs> well, um, I'm not sure whether there's confusion on this, but I think it makes a, a major difference in terms of the discussion. If one wants to bring in Marx's theory of value, whether one views it as an affirmative theory, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't. Right, or descriptive. Or a critical theory. Yeah. Um, a critical theory of a that actually what is being produced, even in the factory, isn't fundamentally the goods. But the mm -hmm. goods are actually the bearers of something abstract. Mm -hmm. And that one of the differences, it seems to me, between a Marxian analysis and a populist analysis, and this has come up several times, is uh, uh, which I thought a lot of speakers also criticized, the idea that you have the real economy because you're making stuff, and then you have the fake economy because it's abstract. At least from a Marxian perspective, it's abstract from the beginning. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it takes on different forms that at times are goods, at times are money. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it seemed to me that um, within that framework, it's not that everything remains the same, but then it, it's a, it becomes interesting to try to conceptualize. How does one get a handle on the kind of changes that you were talking about, for example? Uh, even what I found, even though it was a small point in your talk, I found it very thought-provoking. The whole idea of the separation of work time from time. private time uh, that you're right that you Thompson talks about as you know having to be really imposed on people and finally it's internalized. And now that most of us experience in our own life without thinking about it, it's become really blurred. It's become completely blurred. And how does one relate that to the kinds of larger structural changes that one was talking about? But I was just trying to make the point that the theory of value really is a of an abstract form of mediation that takes on different shapes and is really not a theory about the glorification of creating concrete things by concrete labor and that everything else is parasitic, uh, parasitic on that. Which means also that the question of 
The point of the theory in part is to help illuminate struggles, not just follow them. But there are some struggles, for example, struggles that would be, uh, to give an example that Leo Panic brought in. If, if people were on the street to get uh, CEOs to earn less money, in a sense, that's a waste of energy. It can, it's very understandable. Uh, it's extremely understandable, but that isn't really the point. And it seems to me that part of, part of theory is to try in difficult situations to help clarify what is the point and what is not. And that might help understand what kinds of movements, as you put it, leave something, mm -hmm. leave something in place. And what kind are just sort of flashes? You know, I, one thing that I wanted to say is there's a danger as well. So if it's short drifting of what economists have done with supply and demand is not a theory of that. It doesn't explain a lot of the questions that we have. But you know, it is one that is of great significance as well so in the imaginary of people about how value comes about. And people begin to act with us as if you know the concatenation is demand in, in some way. It's not really supply and demand as economists imagine it. But the concatenation of demand seems to be very often today the only process of valuation that seems to be left. So, you know, I think of Zagat, I think of tar casting shows on television, I think of um, tenure processes in the academy, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, there, there's a strange elective affinity between things that seem very different from each other, and there seem to be you know, common underlying logics there that have something to do with what liberal or neoliberal economists have been talking about, and that I don't find them um, and uh, you know, it, I was just raising this issue. So, you know, we're, we're, is this the only show in town, or is there others, other models that have to be taken seriously? Well, and on that, I'd like to thank our panelists very much, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you.